Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome uh, to the uh, Public Lecture Series Spring 2015, UHI Public Lecture on Our Culture. Um, but today is not uh, an ordinary public lecture, it's an inaugural professorial lecture. Uh, and I'm very, very pleased to say that one of our new professors, um, Professor Keith Smythe, uh, is presenting the talk tonight. I'm going to introduce Keith uh, briefly, uh, just in a minute. Could I just, for those of us on VC, um, uh, just a point out that we're recording the lecture, um, just to make sure, and indeed everyone here as well, make sure you're aware of that. Um, could I ask you on VC to make sure your mics are muted, please? And can I also warn those of you on VC that we can see you? <laughs> <laughs> um, Keith joined UHI as Professor of Pedagogy, and I'll leave Keith himself to perhaps explain what pedagogy is, uh, at the end of July 2014. And since then he's been based at Murray College, UHI in Elgin, but he's been working across the UHI partnership um, to lead and support strategic learning and teaching developments, funded educational research projects, and staff engagement in educational scholarship and research. So you've managed to escape your inaugural lecture for quite a while, but Keith has been very, very busy. Um, particular focus initially on leading the development of our new institutional framework um, for across the partnership, recognizing good practice in learning and teaching, and through that, uh, open up routes to fellowship with the Higher Education Academy uh, for staff across the partnership who are engaging in curriculum development and innovation. He's been taking forward UHI's Learning and Teaching Academy, um, which is a network structure bringing together staff and development opportunities and curriculum development across the partnership. Um, and that will include activity that in due course is going to move into the Education Research and Development Lab that will be part of the Beechwood Campus Development in Inverness. He's been working to draw UHI colleagues and external partners together on a net number of educational research funding bids. And he's been working on a project called eTips, producing online research method textbooks for students, not just here at UHI, but across Scotland as well. All of this is extremely important to us as an institution. We seek to be an innovative institution in terms of learning and teaching, but not to be innovative just for the sake of being innovative. We want to use innovation in design and delivery of the curriculum and the use of technology to bring opportunity to learners right across what is our large and very challenging geographical campus. Working in partnership with and supporting not just our teaching staff, but also our students and helping them to develop their skills in engaging with new forms of curriculum design and delivery. And we want to be through that seen as world leading, genuinely world leading in developing effective new approaches to the delivery of higher and further education. We want to build pedagogy, pedagogical research, as a key part as well of the research identity and activity of the university. And in that context, Keith's appointment at professorial level is only one of a number of senior academic appointments, the other appointments being in traditional academic disciplines that we're making to help to support and facilitate the continued development of the strength and the staff resource that we already have across the partnership to give that additional leadership that is going to help us to move forward and mature and achieve more and more across all cognitive disciplines. And I think you'll see in Keith's presentation that the use of technology to underpin teaching a lot of those approaches can be used to underpin activity in other, other areas of endeavour, whether that is business, university management, or research across distributed 
grid geographically distributed basis. So Keith represents part of a very deliberate and, and structured approach to strengthen the university. And we're very lucky to be able to attract individuals like Keith to the institution. And we're increasingly doing that and bringing in high caliber individuals, individuals with considerable track record around teaching and research to join us. Not simply because they see us as an interesting laboratory, which we are, but they see us as providing an excellent environment within which to apply their own skills and knowledge gained earlier on in their career and use that to develop their understanding, their practice, their standing further, but also bring direct benefit to us and help us to achieve our missions through their expertise. Keith has been very active as a researcher. He has a large number of research publications in education and pedagogy, and he's widely regarded as a leader in that field, engaging with other institutions, both on a collaborative basis, but also at times on a consultancy basis um, to share his expertise with them. We're lucky because we get that built in to our structures. We can take that across our partnership. And pedagogical research, as I've said, is something that we hope Keith is going to help through the Learning Teaching Academy, through our professional development framework, through our relationship with the Higher Education Academy. We hope he is going to help to bring significant numbers of our teaching staff into being active pedagogical researchers and published and world-renowned in their own right. Keith is say a little bit about his own academic background. He's Edinburgh born and bred, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> and he's made a decision though, having worked in the Central Belt, I think all, all of your professional life, to move himself and his family, who are all here tonight, up to now, lock, stock and barrel. Outside of work, his spare time, he says, is taken up by having a young family, four children, I think, yep. Um, being a keen but terrible guitar player, I think we probably could find some fault with that, and a slow but enthusiastic runner. And he's vowed never again after running the Edinburgh Marathon two years ago, um, he would never do it again, but he is contemplating the Edinburgh Marathon next year. And my advice to you would just keep contemplating. <laughs> But Keith's own background, having been brought up in Edinburgh, is interesting to us as well. His education was through what was then Queen Margaret College in Edinburgh, as an undergraduate in information management, managing to graduate top of his year despite what he himself describes as a shaky start. I haven't asked you to elaborate on that. Or I won't elaborate on that. <laughs> <laughs> and he then. So that is Queen Margaret University as it is now. That was you know, not at that time one of the established universities. That was a relatively new higher education provider. And studying, like us, a relatively new, innovative, forward-facing university. He then undertook a PhD in education and network learning with the Open University through Queen Margaret College whilst also lecturing on a range of courses, including research methods. And he then worked at Edinburgh and Napier University, first as an academic development advisor in online learning, then as a lecturer in higher education, and then a senior teacher and fellow and senior lecturer in higher education within the office of the vice principal academic. So he's moved rapidly through a relatively new university developing, developing its own role in terms of innovation, in terms of its own strategy, in terms of the use of digital technologies to explore new markets, make itself accessible to learners in just the same way that we now are. So there's real parallels, and I'm sorry to those of you from Napier here today, but we're very glad we've spoken to <laughs> so recently. And um, we will learn a lot from what he has learned through working with you. But I do mean that in a very positive way. And part of that, it's part of what Keith brings to the institution there is a networking. It's an engagement with colleagues in these other universities in Scotland that we can continue to engage with them. And indeed, some of that eTips project and some of the online publication is being done very much in collaboration with those other institutions. Um, and I, even yesterday, I was down in Edinburgh at Napier um, having a dialogue with that one, one of the visitors here today from Napier. 
Keith's also in his own time been involved with a number of education and social inclusion charities. He's been vice chair of the board of directors for LEAD, Linking Education and Disability, and is currently a trustee of the social innovation charity People No Time. And I think to me, this is another indication of why Keith is such a good appointment for UHI. A big part of our mission is to make our curriculum accessible on a fair and an equivalent basis across all sectors of our community, both geographical and in terms of people's social or life backgrounds that they're coming into. Education, and I'm sure Keith would call himself an educationalist as well as an educator. Education is not just a job. It's not just a research subject. It is a vocation. And it does make a genuine difference to people's lives and futures. And digital practice helps us to do that. And Keith, I think now, is going to give us some insight into how and why it helps us to do that. So, Keith, please take the floor. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you, Craig, for that um, lovely introduction. And um, thank you for everyone who's come along tonight. Um, it's, it's been um, really, um, uh, really kind of pleasing and, uh, you know, to see so many friends from the, the past year today, a uh, number of new colleagues, a number of people who I haven't met yet and who've um, decided this is a, a, a good punt for their Tuesday night this week. Um, so it's uh, a real pleasure. Um, before I start my talk tonight, um, I just want to acknowledge a few people. Um, usually we do thanks at the end, um, but there are a number of people here tonight that are actually really kind of pivotal to me in terms of um, being in higher education and uh, being in the role of Minchis now. Um, uh, I think from Queen Margaret we've got um, Cathy Butler and Jim Herring who saw me through um, undergraduate and um, postgraduate studies. Um, so thanks very much indeed for coming. Um, Fred Parsifal, I think it's Fred. Um, uh, my boss at Napier, who um, allowed me to do lots of things that were really interesting and, and, and um, perhaps on the fringes of what I should have been doing, um, um, but I've learned so much from that. Um, but there's other people as well um, that I, I really um, should thank. Um, Andrew Comrie, who I worked with on a, a big um, cross-institutional project I'll talk about tonight, uh, and also um, Karen Aitchison, who was my boss in the last few years at Napier, and who again um, was absolutely fantastic um, at, and turning a blind eye to things that are kind of on the fringes of what we should have been doing, <laughs> but were really important in terms of education and how we develop it. Um, I've had uh, a number of co-conspirators in these slightly off-the-wall um, projects, chief amongst which um, is my friend Julia Fotheringham, uh, and also Christina Minka and um, Nori Brown. So a number of people here that I'm really grateful to see, um, and other people will get a mention as we go along, but you only get one mention. So, um, <laughs> Craig and... Um, as we explain what pedagogy is, I think it's, it's quite a contested word. I think probably um, the definition we'll work with tonight is, is it's about the practice and the development of learning and teaching. Um, and then perhaps the scholarship of learning and teaching as well. How we research what we do, how we make it better. And I'm going to come back to some of those themes as I go along. I uh, rather usually got rid of my presentation, so I'll just pull that back up. There we go. So, um, what I'd like to talk about tonight is an idea that's really close to me in terms of uh, more professional practice, um, but also in terms of some of the wider um, interests and, and, and things that I care about, um, many of which um, Crichton has um, mentioned. So we're going to look at the idea of third space um, and how it applies in particular to um, universities and what we do, um, the communities that we sit within and we try to engage our students with, and also where digital practice um, can come to play an increasingly important part in how we think about a conceptualised university and what we try to do. There are a number of things that I would like to address this evening. Um, the first I've touched upon, the idea of third space that applies to education. 
but I also want to spend some time exploring what's happening in schools right now in terms of learning and teaching and digital practice and why it's so important to AG uh, and why it also presents us with a challenge that we have to rise to really quite quickly. Um, I would like to look at how we encourage our academic colleagues to make more effective use of digital spaces and tools, building upon good practice that we see across many different institutions. And I'd also like to look at the, at the broader possibilities around using digital tools and spaces for how we engage our learners. Uh, and then we'll conclude by looking at what digital cloud space might mean to us as practitioners, as educators, in terms of enhancing our own practice, but also our own scholarship around learning and teaching. And then finally, looking at the wider implications for universities in general, but also for UHI. Before I proceed, I'd like to present two framing propositions of Colton. Um, these, these are um, two things, two viewpoints that are really dear to me and underpin the ways in which I think about these technology and the purpose of universities. Um, you don't have to agree with these. Um, it would be really interesting if you didn't when we get to the, the discussion. Um, but these are just two things that set the context for some of what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, the first is that um, I really strongly believe that the most effective uses of technology aren't about delivering content, although that is very important, but they're about providing spaces to allow people to create and to allow them to engage, to engage with each other, to engage with themselves, to engage with the broader communities that they aspire to join, both professional and, and, and more general. The second framing proposition is that while I believe online technology is absolutely key to inclusive education and open educational practice, we need to refocus the current debate around open education away from being almost exclusively about technology and online opportunities um, to also come back and look at how we use our physical space and spaces and locations. And I think something really pivotal happening around technology at the moment in education. Um, and if we're going to realise the promise of it, when we think open, we need to think about not just the online, but the on campus and the, in the community as well. First of all, um, I should explain the concept of cloud space. I know that a number of people in the, the audience might be familiar with this, um, some very familiar. Um, the idea of third space, sometimes called third place, um, it's been around for a while in sociology and in psychology and social research. Um, probably um, the best known definition of it, and probably the definitive text, is uh, Ray Oldenburg's um, book, The Great Good Place, cafes, coffee shops, bookstores, bars, hair salons, and other hangouts at the heart of our community. The whole notion of the third space is about those spaces in our community where people can come together around shared interests, shared goals, differences, um, where they can come together um, without carrying any baggage around who they are or their experience, where they can come together um, to meet a collective good very often, it might be a shared goal or it might just be a kind of broad interest that they all share together and where they can potentially meet people that they otherwise might not get the opportunity to meet. Now, the, the, these are some of the key characteristics of third spaces. Um, as Oldenburg originally conceptualized it, over the years, there's been a lot of discussion about the, the notion of third space in relation to technology, and I'll say a little bit about that. Um, but two of the things that are quite relevant to our sort of, um, uh, how we might think about digital third spaces, is that it can bring together people that otherwise wouldn't have an opportunity to meet because they're geographically dispersed, for example. And also, um, when we talk about digital third spaces, these, these kind of safe spaces online, these alternative spaces for people to engage, quite often we can look at the potential for issues within that third space to be amplified out with it when we're looking at online um, interaction and engagement. Again, I'll say a little bit more about this. But there are some of the basic characteristics. Um, and I think probably the ones that are most important to me is that third space is providing mutual grounds where difference is embraced and where social status and, and what you're bringing in is valued but are relevant in terms of who you are and in terms of you being judged as a person or an individual. So a definition for tonight, just to put in context um, what I'm about to talk about. Um, when we think about third spaces in relation to education, the working definition I want to use tonight is that third, third spaces are spaces or annexes, to borrow a word from my friend Alex Benedin, so that extend their opportunities for engaging with learners within the university 
but also beyond the university. They can be digital or they can be physical. They're spaces that allow us to make connections between different groups of learners within and beyond the university, allow our students to connect with the wider communities they belong to, and I'm using the word student there quite purposely, um, those that are registered who are in the university, can allow them to connect with the wider communities they're aspiring to join. And also, um, third spaces in education terms, also about allowing universities to better connect with communities within which we sit. And that's where we, we can talk about both the digital and the physical, and I'll come back to that. Now, I should say that a lot of what's about to follow is going to be hopelessly optimistic. Um, <laughs> some of it might be a little bit cynical at points, but largely hopelessly optimistic. Um, and I don't make any apologies for that, because I think we should be aspirational in how we think about some of these issues. Um, my heart's not on my sleeve, and it would be on my lapel if it wasn't for this microphone. Um, so, a, a forewarning of some of what's about to follow. I'd like to sum up by looking at what's happening in our schools around learning and teaching generally, and also digital practice, and why it's so important to us in higher education. And I'd like to pause and think about what's happened in the Scottish context around the curriculum for excellence. Now, there will be a number of people in the room that are very familiar with this, are knowledgeable about it. Um, the curriculum for excellence has had its um, critics as well as its supporters. But I'd like to focus on the implications for how our learners, how our young people are learning in school. Um, because when it's implemented well, where it's being implemented well, um, they're having really quite a different experience from the one they might expect when they get into some universities. Not exclusively, but really quite a different experience in some situations. So the curriculum for excellence is based around four dimensions of successful learners, confident individuals, responsible citizens, effective contributors. And when we look at what these things mean in practice, just to pick out a few, um, enabling our learners to think creatively and independently, to develop the literacy, communication, and numeracy skills, these are things you'd expect. But when you brought, bring that into combination with um, working in partnerships and in teams, taking the initiative to lead, to create things, to create resources, not just rely on the resources we provide them with, to create artifacts, it really becomes quite interesting. And where the curriculum for excellence is working well, it's engaging our learners in what we might kind of call maker pedagogies or learning and teaching approaches that put the onus on our learners as creators to create things collectively, individually, and for a purpose, usually not just how they're assessed, but usually what they want to communicate, their own personal development. Um, we can see versions on this around what we sometimes call digital maker pedagogy, where the focus there is on them as digital creators and makers uh, and contributors to, to um, creating artifacts, online bodies of knowledge, a whole range of things. This, I think, is really quite interesting because for me, um, what's happening in schools at the moment, and, and we see this beyond Scotland, across the whole primary and secondary um, sector and in other countries as well, um, there's really quite a focus on some of what we would consider in education, in higher education, progressive pedagogical practice, I think. Um, in many schools, it's not progressive, it's the norm. And I think we've got a challenge there that we need to address, and I'll come back to that. The implications of how um, are being engaged in school and what they've been asked to do um, was brought home to ourselves a couple of years ago um, through the most unexpected source you can imagine. Sonny Bean. <laughs> now, there's a few people laughing. Can I just have a show of hands if you know who Sonny Bean is? A few people. Sonny Bean uh, was reputedly uh, a cave dwelling cannibal who lived on the west coast of Scotland in the 15th or 16th century. This is where it's disputed, no one's quite sure. Um, and him and his family brought the passers by um, of the possessions and, and um, uh, everything else they had on them uh, as a means of sustaining themselves. Now, um, why did Sonny Bean teach me about the curriculum for excellence? Well, he, um, he taught me about the curriculum for excellence because one day one of our daughters came home from school and said, we're doing a project about Scottish folklore and famous people in Scottish history, and we can pick anyone we like to do this project on, and we can produce anything we like. So, so he got the right report. No, no, we can produce anything, um, anything we like, but we've got to pick a person and find out about them. So I said, well, what are you going to do? He said, I don't know. Um, 
William Wallace? That would be a few William Wallaces getting done. Robert the Bruce? Oh, I'm not sure about that. Um, well, let's, let's have a wee look online. So we had a look online and we found um, a website about um, lesser known famous <laughs> Scottish <laughs> writers. <laughs> uh, and we came across Sonia Bean. Um, and her daughter Eva, um, who I think might be a goth in the making, <laughs> was attracted to the story of Sonny Bean. Um, uh, and, and all the various um, uh, macabre elements to it. And, and, um, but she, she liked, I, I like that. I want to do my project with Sonny Bean. So when we then set about discussing what you're going to produce, what you want to do. Well, I want to write about it. I'll do it like maybe a kind of poster. Um, but I want to make his cave as well. You want to make his cave? Yeah, that's the thing I want to take in for presentation. Sonny Bean's cave with all his family and all his victims in there. <laughs> so we went from the point of um, using the online spaces we had at our disposal to find out about Sonny Bean. But then we set about the, the, the business of finding video clips that explain more about him. Uh, we set about the business of um, looking online to find out how do you make a paper mache cave? Um, and, and how are we going to make these figures? So we brought this project together, well, we brought this project together with a little bit of help from her, from her and a little bit of help from myself, who was scratching his head in the background. Um, but we brought this project together, and the day came in, the day came by we should take the project into the, into the school. So she had made the cave, she'd done the kind of poster presentation that took it in. And we got to win, all the parents were invited in for this. Um, so you had some folk dressed up as William Wallace, about to be William Wallace, but we're right there. <laughs> um, a Robert the Bruce, a few other characters, and then Eva standing there with her Sony in the cave. <laughs> so we looked, and there was a few other, lots of other kids that kind of done something similar, picked some, someone unknown and done something really interesting. What was quite um, eye-opening about this though, was when I was speaking to the teacher afterwards, and the teacher said, I've never heard of Sonny Bean. I've never heard of Sonny Bean. Um, it completely passed me by. Um, and, and that was really interesting because it made me think, well, what's happening there? Um, learners at school have been able to make their own choices about what they're going to research. And, and it was research. They're learning research like ways. We talk about research teaching linkages, but they're doing it already. Um, she made a decision about what she was going to research, what was going to be produced. She went online to look at various things that other people produced to gather the material. Uh, and then she took something in that was completely new to the teacher. And that just made me think, well, there's something in this. And it's around the change roles that are being, um, and, and expectations that are being brought about through things like the curriculum for excellence and how people are learning in schools. And this whole thing about digital makeup pedagogy. Um, so a real eye opener. Um, and, and, and one that's kind of stuck with me as I think about to what extent do we always give students that sort of choice in university and for <laughs> higher education? And we do, but to what extent are we really embracing it? There was another thing that um, uh, very shortly after that, and I won't um, elaborate this um, too much, but our eldest daughter um, started secondary school after the summer. So we got a bit of an insight into how the curriculum for excellence was happening in, uh, in secondary school. So Freya came home and said, um, okay, so we've been doing um, Stone Age history and a history class, and we've got to produce a project. Okay, what have you got to do? We just produce a project. What, what have they told you? We can do anything. Um, we can write something if we want, we can do a presentation, do a poster. And what do you want to do? I'm going to do a holiday brochure. So she decided to do a holiday brochure about Stone Age history. Um, which she called Stonehaven Holidays. I'm sure that's going to be right somewhere. Um, and what she did, and this is what the teachers, you know, the direction from the teachers was to produce anything you like as long as you cover what we've looked at in the class. So this holiday brochure brought together everything that was covered around accommodation. So come to Stonehaven Holidays. Um, we offer you and your family a truly prehistoric experience. Our accommodation, dining, crafts, and activities truly take you back in time. Enjoy the following. So we've got accommodation with the proviso that um, we don't supply materials through TP and you might have to fight for a cave. <laughs> All the information around um, uh, Stone Age diets got presented under the um, Stone Age holidays category of fine dining, catch it yourself. <laughs> Crafting tools and weapons. Fashion workshops, the discerning <laughs> holiday maker, and all kinds of other things in between. But this for me really encapsulates what's possible and 
the types of engagement we can get when we say to our learners, here are the, here are the rough parameters. Now you go off and you produce something you think is meaningful. Another thing that struck me about the curriculum, for instance, and, and just how people, the learners are learning in schools generally at the moment, is I can't remember very much from primary school at all. But we did do a project on Sonic Bean. And we did learn about it through song. And one of the only things I can remember from primary school was the rhyme, Sonny Bean, Sonny Bean, the hungriest man you've ever seen. <laughs> and I think that says something about learning creatively and the things that stick with us when we learn in more creative ways. What's the challenge here? Um, I think part of the challenge here is that um, our learners, our young learners are engaging in different spaces online to access knowledge, bring it together. They're using different digital tools and technologies almost intuitively to produce what they want to produce. And they're doing it in a really engaging, enjoyable, meaningful way and producing either real or authentic artifacts. I'm not sure that we do as much of that in higher education as we could. Um, I think that there's lots of good practice around, but I think we've got a real challenge in terms of the generation that's coming through now into higher education who expect to learn in this way and who are experienced in learning this way. I have a real worry that it's either going to be a slap around the face for them, um, for us, or potentially both. And I think we need to think quite quickly about how we encourage more of our teaching colleagues to make effective and creative use of digital tools and spaces. Not to the exclusion of traditional teaching, um, but to enhance that um, to contribute to it. And to make sure that our learners are going to be leaving higher education with the digital skills and literacies and the life-wide and the lifelong skills they're going to need both generally and in the professions that they're preparing for. I think there's lots of different ways we can think about how we try to engage our teaching colleagues to make better use of digital spaces and tools. Um, I want to share one example from one experience, which is around the TSET project. Um, this was a cross-institutional project that we undertook at Napier with two partner FE colleges a few years ago. And the focus of the TSET project was around getting um, academics, lecturers, to redesign one, of their own, one or more of their own courses. Firstly, to ensure that we have collaborative learning opportunities. Secondly, to ensure that there was meaningful use made of technology to do more than deliver content. And I don't question delivery of content, but to do more than deliver content. And thirdly, that some aspect of those projects involved a good degree of learner choice and autonomy. So the learners could learn and research like ways, they could investigate, they could pursue their own lines of inquiry. Um, the TSET project ran for two or three years and engaged I'm not sure how many staff in the end are in terms of being inside of the practice, um, but it's still got the next you know, within the partner institutions and beyond today. Um, and I think um, part of that was the way in which we tried to approach how, our, how the academics harness technology and more progressive approaches in ways that were meaningful to them. How do you contextualize some of these things to the discipline you're in? How do you contextualize some of these things to the fact that well, you're quite new to using technology and your learners might be one or two steps ahead of you? One of the things that um, I worked on in the, the PSET project was something at the time was called the three-year approach. Um, this was a framework that was designed to take well-established ideas about scaffolding, lots of support for learners when they're new, and then experience less support over time. It was based on well-established ideas around um, negotiated learning and how that could be more motivating for students. And it was based around ideas of collaborative practice and the importance of collaborative practice. Now, the three approach um, was based around a sort of three stage continuum, if you like. Um, we're at an enhanced level, we're talking about really simple adjustments to teaching practice that just get the learners to be a bit more active, a bit more engaged, and take a bit more control. At the extend level, we're talking about new or further developed opportunities that would require the learner to make at least some key decisions, not all the decisions, but at least some key decisions <laughs> about what they learned, how they learned it, what they're going to produce, and how they'd be assessed. And then in power level, it was about redesigning teaching from scratch to ensure that it was the learners' needs and interests that were driving the learning experience from the outset. And it was important to us that, um, at the very least, there would always be peer support opportunities for learners, recognising that they need to know multiple perspectives, need to be able to argue, need to be able to see different viewpoints, 
But ideally, um, there would be collaborative learning opportunities. Um, so our, our practitioners worked with this and we designed their courses based on this tool. And it was about recognising people start and end up in different places depending on the, the level of the, the subject, um, their own experience, what the students expect. A few years ago at Edmund Napier, we were looking to make a significant change across the institution around how technology was used in learning and teaching. Uh, we revisited the three approach and we developed it as the three framework, um, where we slightly twisted what the, frame, what the three approach was about to make it more focused on the use of technology. Here we were talking about adopting technology in simple but effective ways to get learners to be more active. <laughs> All the way through to an empower stage, using technology in ways that underpinned higher order individual and collaborative learning activities that reflected as close as possible how the learners would be expected to create, contribute, share, and collaborate around knowledge within the disciplines we're preparing for, and also in the real world more generally. We took a learning and teaching approach to this. Um, we devised a range of examples, all taken from the TSET project around essays. What would you do you know, in terms of engaging students in essays around this continuum? What would you do around seminar participation? So for example, at the enhanced level, a discussion board where learners are um, required to post follow-ups to face-to-face -face seminars, for example, and ask questions. At the extent level, where we're getting to take more responsibility, two or three learners each week taking turns to summarise that week's face-to-face -face discussion and post follow-up questions for the rest of the peers, all the way through to an empower level, having students work in pairs of small groups for them to design and run the seminar, not for the tutors to do it, but with the tutors in a supporting role. Um, so we developed this framework, we rolled it out across Edmund Napier um, and thinking that well, other, other institutions are facing these challenges, um, we decided to roll it out more widely as well across the um, sector and we made it available as a Creative Commons tool. Um, we were very surprised I think initially when we did do this at the, the kind of uptake of the community framework. And we found that it started to get used um, across a number of institutions. So, for example, um, Plymouth Margin University College um, is the basis of their institutional strategy around learning and teaching using technology. Um, it's the basis for the Technology Enhanced Learning Quality Framework at York's John University. Um, that diagram in the middle, I don't speak a word of Greek, but I trust that says what's supposed to. Um, that's a Greek translation of the three framework that guided um, uh, a government funding project in Greece where a number of school teachers in the primary and secondary sectors used the framework to redesign the school curriculum to make more effective use of technology. And we'll be come back and say a little more on that. Um, I've given you a flavour of how it works in practice. Um, I want to just highlight here that we also looked how we could use that framework in a curriculum design context. Uh, as a way of role modelling to our academics or educators how to use technology in their own learning and teaching practice. And this um, exemplifies how we implemented the three framework within our own PG CERT, Landing Online Education of Nature, where module one was a length of enhanced stage, module two, um, the extended stage, and then module three, the point where people left the PG CERT, the empower stage. And to give you an example of how we approach that, then just to take one line of activities at the enhanced level, thought, something we call thought discussions, but open discussions where our academic pick the, the topic we're interested in, pick the readings we're interested in, and then engage with each other around those kind of shared interests. Moving on to student-led seminars, but then moving on to engagement in online professional communities. And the whole point there was to scaffold a process whereby our learners, who just in this case happen to be academics, could be supported to develop the skills and the knowledge, and then quite quickly get to a point where they could look after their own continued professional development. So this activity around joining professional communities involves saying to our academics, pick an online or an online supported community in your discipline area, or one about technology enhanced learning, go and join it. Um, be part of that group, contribute to it, see what you can learn from that group, and then come back online and share it with everyone else. Uh, and so the way in which the, the, the class, the group were assessed was they effectively, between them, um, created a, a directory to a whole range of online communities 
learn space groups, if you like, online. They could support their continued learning once they'd left the program. But what was really fundamental to us here was that they were joining these communities before they left the program. They weren't being left to join these communities once they left the program. Uh, and I think there's something about how we use our digital spaces to engage our learners as early as we can in the professional communities and the discipline related communities they're going to be joining. So that it's not a big challenge to face as they get towards the end of the program studies. And there's something um, in this as well that we, we were quite interested in because these examples that I've just kind of shared, these tended to be the examples that most of the people on the program took into their own practice. Whether they were school teachers or college lecturers, or university lecturers, these were the things that they pounced upon and said, this could work for me in my context. And I just want to kind of a small note around the use of social media and student-owned technologies, the technology in their hands. Um, there's a lot of talk about the difference between institutionally owned things, the virtual learning environment, mm -hmm. where we put our students into modules and give them access to things based on the modules they're part of. And then on the other hand, externally owned tools. Now, lots of debate around this, lots of things around um, data protection and data ownership, um, who owns what, who does what. For me, the fundamental difference between some of our institutional technologies and things like LinkedIn or Facebook or openly available kind of wikis or blogs or whatever else you might be familiar with, the fundamental difference is that these external tools allow our learners to cluster around shared interests and they allow them, they allow them to self-organize. And self-organization is absolutely fundamental to effective learning. Um, and it's something that we need to think carefully about in terms of how we bring together institutional tools with the other tools that our learners may be engaged with already. We want to get the best of both worlds with to bring these things together um, and not worry so much about, well, what are they doing out there? Because it's happening already. My youngest child, um, Finley, is at this very moment sitting there engaged in his own digital third space. <laughs> <laughs> and what I think we have to yeah, hide, <laughs> what I think we have to acknowledge there is that sometimes, the things that are happening in the digital spaces that our students occupy are a lot, lot more interesting than the things that happen in spaces like this. Take your six, you just walk out your pocket money. <laughs> there are other opportunities, I think, how we think about um, supporting our colleagues to engage with technology. Um, this is another example of, um, of how the three frameworks have been implemented. And it's something we're thinking about, something we've discussed, we're early stages discussing um, introducing here at UHI. Uh, and this is at um, the Quarry University in Sydney, Australia, who have put together a large scale program um, called Design, Develop, and Implement, where they're providing direct support for program teams to rapidly start exploring technologies and, and, and new pedagogical approaches and take them all the way through of, you know, over a period of about four to five months and redesigning the entire programs. But they're harnessing the three framework and some other tools in order to do this. Um, I think we need to probably realize that the speed at which learning is developing out with the formal context of the university or our colleges means that we need new approaches if we're going to keep up with it. Uh, and not just keep up with it, but embrace it and make effective use of it. Um, and we have a problem there because most universities are locked into either a three or sometimes a five year cycle program design, approval, validation, reapproval. That's fine. But being locked into a three or five year cycle um, and having only three or five year opportunities to, to overhaul what we do or redesign it substantially does not reflect the speed at which things are moving out, moving out in the real world around learning and teaching. We need to be much more agile. We need to have processes in place that are malleable and they can respond to what people need to do when they need to do it. Because I think the generation of learners are coming into college and university now, um, they, they don't care what the technology is called. Um, they don't care what we, how we describe our pedagogy, our learning and teaching approaches. They want to be engaged and they want to be actively engaged and they want the opportunity to create things. And I think we need to think really carefully about that. And it's not just us, it isn't just us. Um, there are lots of other institutions and organisations that are concerned about this that aren't within formal higher education. And I don't know if, if Jane's here, if Jane's made it, Jane Donaldson. Thanks. So. My colleague Jane and I um, 
and, and Julia, who were at Napier a couple of years ago, found ourselves through a process I'm not quite sure we even understand to this day, working on a large um, research project around technology enhanced learning um, for a major government funded organisation who wanted to look at how they could embrace technology for their own kind of training needs. Um, we're not allowed to speak too much about this. Suffice to say, though, those adverts that are online for um, you know, joint forces and lead events, they suddenly start taking a slightly different tone when they start talking about join the army, co create your learning experience, be a digital maker. <laughs> then we might have had some responsibility for that. <laughs> but there's other well established institutions and organisations with an interest in learning and development mm -hmm. um, that are realising we need to move much more quickly than we're doing just now. Um, in a meaningful way, not in a knee jerk way, um, but we need to move much more quickly than we do at the moment. So, if we get this right, what are the implications? What are the broader possibilities? Um, I think there are many. Um, there are lots of pedagogical models that emerge in the sector that are about just what we've been talking about um, opportunities to learn, to speak to creators, to actively engage to be engaged in research-like activities and to learn in research-like ways. Uh, one of the most important for me, I think, is the Students Producer Initiative at uh, University of Lincoln, where they have taken all the curriculum of the whole university and focused it around research-based learning and teaching. So the learners are the researchers. So they're working together, collaborating together on research projects, and they're producing things um, that are authentic. They're producing social issue reports that have a relevance beyond um, the, the, the course they're on and the people who are going to assess them. They're producing digital artifacts um, for local businesses. They're doing all kinds of things um, that really exemplify at a higher education level what's happening in schools at the moment. And I think thing, ideas around students as producer, um, students as researchers, they're a natural extension. You know, they're the next, they're the next natural, the natural next step from what's happening through things like the curriculum for excellence. And we need to be really careful how we think about this. We can also think about how we can um, harness and utilize um, third spaces, digital third spaces, in terms of um, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary learning. This is something I learned about from uh, my colleague Peter Hartley, who's here tonight. Um, we've done a lot of work, he's done a lot of work in recent years around program focused assessment. And he alerted me to some of the things that were happening across the sector, including at the University of Strathclyde, vertically integrating projects. Projects that go from the first year of an undergraduate degree all the way up to fourth year, where the first years play novice research roles that give them particular research tasks to do. But the students in the second year, or third year, or fourth year take much more responsibility. And your master's students, or sometimes with your PhD students, they're the principal investigators, they're directing the projects. But what this is doing is exemplifying just how people learn in the real world. Uh, those that are newer to the discipline engage with the more experienced peers. The more experienced peers take more responsibility over time for what we do and what's produced and where it goes. And when you look at how these projects are assessed and what they're producing, it's, it's much more creative than just a group report. Um, they're producing the artifacts, producing programs, they're producing things that people can use. And there's something here about how we use our curricula and how we use our approaches to assessment to ensure that our learners are engaging with the wider community in which we sit and to allow them to contribute things to that wider community, to allow them to choose things for business. Um, let's not wait until third or fourth year in their own work placement. Let's look at our assessment practices and think about how we can twist those so they're producing things that are of relevance to small business down the road um, or of relevance to... Um, you know, uh, the printmaker down the street, of relevance to the, the community education project is looking for some volunteers. We need to really think about this carefully. And I think we have to think very carefully about how we conceptualize the open learning agenda. Um, now, many of us in the room will have some familiarity with uh, open education and some of the things that are happening around. Um, massive loop and online courses um, and things of that type, that's fine. But there was a certain amount of promise when people started talking about open online education. And that promise was around widening access to those who could most benefit from getting access to higher education. What we've seen 
in most, not all, but what we've seen in most of the examples of um, uh, large scale open education initiatives, these open online courses, some of them are very good, but what we've largely seen is them amplifying access to higher education for those that already have degrees, for those that already have qualifications. Um, they've been less about widening access to education for those that are aspiring to get there. One project I worked on um, while I was at Leeds Scotland was the Thinking Digitally online course. Now, um, Leeds Scotland, they support learners and their carers to get access to educational opportunities, uh, largely at FE level, sometimes you know, in other contexts. But part of the challenge for some of their learners is that through, through their disability, they've often found themselves disadvantaged or disenfranchised from the conventional education system. They don't have perhaps the experience and qualifications that their, their peers have. So the whole part of thinking digitally was to take the, the, the idea of open online education and make it relevant to those who are aspiring to get into education. And the basic format was really simple. The learners could come in and tell us what they were interested in. They wanted to be a joiner, or they wanted to get access to an engineering course in, in college, or they were really interested in the Hibs Football Club. It didn't matter. They could tell us what they were interested in. And the course, through a series of online group and individual activities, supported them to create a digital artifact about the thing they were interested in. Hibs Football Club, being an engineer, getting into hairdressing, whatever they were interested in. Now this was formally assessed, but this was a small scale initiative. We could possibly assess a bit of the subject expertise to assess all the subjects that they were producing their artifacts on. So instead of we assessed it, was to assess them on the digital skills and literacies that they could evidence having developed through producing their digital artifacts, through having researched the topic, brought something together, and produced something meaningful. And that's what they were assessed on. And what that meant, the, and it was, you know, it was 12 credits that, um, so, you know, FE level. So what that meant was that these learners, when they produced these things, they could go into the context that they had previously moved to the physical and say, okay, I'm interested in getting onto this joinery course. Um, I don't have this qualification, that experience, but here's this digital artifact I produced about um, a major joinery project that's happening in Edinburgh right now. And here's the proof that I was assessed and can pass coursework at FE level. And here are the digital skills and literacies I, I developed as a result. And I think this is one small example. There are many more things like this happening. But I think any university or any college that has this series of widening and access and open education agenda needs to look much more carefully, much more seriously, how we can make open education meaningful for those that aspire to get into FE or HE, not for those that have got the qualifications already. They're welcome. But that's what this was supposed to be about originally. And I think you know, we need to make more space to look at those that are aspiring to get into education. So moving on from that, what are the implications for how we might develop our universities? First of all, um, I think we take a critical view of where we're at right now. There's some fantastic practice happening across um, the sector in every university. That, that isn't under question. But there are things happening in schools and in society that mean that we're in danger of falling, not a couple of steps behind, but really quite a few steps behind. So I think we need a critical view of what we want to do and how we might want to rethink the development of our universities. Um, I have a couple of colleagues that are very strong in this area and who I could only you know, aspire to be um, as kind of thoughtful about around the purpose of higher education. Um, but I would recommend uh, if you're interested in these issues, you look at Richard Holmes' blog and also Mark Johnson's blog. Um, really interesting thoughts around how we might want to reconceptualize what we do over the coming years. Richard's um, latest post is uh, <coughs> Academic Bewilderment, which is something I've experienced a little bit of tonight um, <laughs> in the run-up to this talk. We also need to be really kind of mindful about some of the things that Crichton alluded to in his introduction. Education isn't just about getting people qualifications. Education is about the development of people and the development of society. And we need to think very carefully about how we balance the needs to, needs for any institution to stand on its own two feet and be able to compete and attract students with the wider mission, wider social mission of higher education. 
There's no shortage of evidence about the links between access to education, life <coughs> social well-being, and social mobility, if you like that term. I'm not too positive about it, but if you take it for what it can be. Um, there's also a lot of debate at the moment around access to lifelong higher education, formal and informal, um, being a really important part of the social contract between ourselves and the state and ourselves and society in which we exist. And we need to be mindful about what this might mean for institutions like ours that's dispersed across such a big region, such a diverse range of students as well. And I may come back and touch upon a relating point. Uh, Frank Rennie alerted me, Frank Rennie's alerted me to lots of things since I started here. Um, one of the things he alerted me to recently, um, and all good stuff, I should say, um, was a recent article by Leslie Riddick, um, who talks about the People's University of Scotland, and she's talking mainly in, in you know, the context of history and people have access to um, information about the country and where they stay and things. But she was talking about People's University of Scotland, where we could reconceptualize what's available to those in the communities where, where we're based. Um, so we have educators going out into society, leading, leading walks around you know, areas of kind of interest, doing talks and things of particular interest. Then I see Alex is smiling. Um, uh, Alex has been doing this long before this article came out. Um, but you know, but there's something important here. There's a debate around what's the wider purpose of higher education, what's the higher, wider purpose of higher education in Scotland. Um, and I think we need to be mindful that some of the best higher education um, out in the community isn't absolutely universities. It often involves people that are moonlighting from the universities, but it isn't happening in universities. A lot of it is happening in places like the Free University of Brighton. We're about to launch a completely free degree in higher education for anyone that's interested. The Social Science Centre in Lincoln which I believe kind of spun out some of the ideas that Lincoln University had about the student's producer. And the Ragged University, which uh, Alex Leiden runs, um, and which uses third spaces in the community to bring scholars, academics, artisans, hobbyists together, those that are interested in hearing what they've got to say. And if you look at, um, if you look at the ethos behind these things, the Free University of Brighton, the tagline, Education for Love, Not Money, the Social Science Centre Lincoln, Free Corporate Higher Education, the Ragged Project, Knowledge is Power, the Only Man Shared, it's gone right back to this notion of education and access to education as a public good. Now, what I find quite difficult, and it kind of tears me in two different directions, having been involved in things like this and being on the fringes of what Ragged does, is so that many of our educators from within our universities are engaging in these projects. And when you speak to some of them, and this is only anecdotal, but I've spoken to many of them, they're often getting involved in these things because they want to be an educator in the very broadest sense of the word. They don't want to be tied in just to the courses of teaching, the modules and programs of teaching. Um, they want, they believe in education as a social right, as a public good, and they want to exercise their right as educators to practice education in a way that benefits the public. And we need to think about this, because while we're a couple of steps behind around technology, and maybe what's happening in schools at the moment, we're also potentially, universities are also potentially being left behind in the wider social mission of education. Um, that isn't to say there's a good practice. There is. But there are groups out there that are making it their, their main focus in terms of broadening out access to higher education. And again, I might touch upon some of that as we conclude. There are also some ideas that start to emerge which um, help us think about our own campus spaces, our digital spaces, our formal and informal education in really quite useful ways. Um, two or three years ago at Napier, um, I was fortunate enough to um, coordinate our Digital Futures consultation across the university where a number of colleagues came together to talk about the direction that Napier wanted to take as a digital university. Not a university that's fully online, but it's a university that harnesses good digital practice in any way that it can, where relevant. And I learned about the work of Sheila McNeil at Glasgow Caledonian and her colleague Bill Johnston at Strathclyde around their conceptual matrix for a digital university. Now, this is an idea that's gained a lot of traction over the last three or four years. And they're talking about reconceptualizing the university as a digital university. Um, 
where we think about digital participation, both on campus and our courses, but also how our learners contribute and participate digitally out there in society, and what they might take into society, how they might engage with public bodies of knowledge, how some of the coursework, instead of writing an essay that the two people will mark and then never look at again, how some of the coursework might be in the form of um, uh, papers, articles, that are then contributed to public bodies of knowledge, digital bodies. They're also looking at the role of our curriculum. Who owns the curriculum? Um, how should it disperse? And they're looking at things like, um, not just information literacy per se, but how do we ensure that the literacies that we help to develop in our students and our learners are the ones that they need? Um, and this is a fastly moving area. Um, but the one, you know, so the challenge is how to make sure that they're, they're set up to at least continue in terms of their own development and look after their own literacy development. So lots of really interesting ideas in here. And I think, without wanting to go into this in any detail, we need to be aware that there's tools out there that can help us think about where we bring together the digital with the physical, where we bring together what we do within our courses and what our students might do out in the wider communities or professions that they're going to join. How we can produce things through the curriculum that might have value to the communities that we sit within, um, that don't just have, have value as artifacts of assessment for our students, either pass or fail on. We've um, uh, been working with Sheila and Bill to look at some of these issues in a wider context. But one of the things that we concluded at the end of the, the Digital Futures consultation in Napier is that a useful way to think about some of these things, digital third spaces, learners engaging with communities for the join, um, us not having to create all material, but introducing activities where the learners create things that are valued to others, was around this concept of the digitally distributed curriculum. A curriculum that would involve using digital spaces to have program-wide projects that would use digital spaces to make sure that a group of engineers that are here can connect with, learn with and produce things with a group of business students that are there. And would use digital spaces um, to take the outcomes of that work and make it available publicly wherever possible uh, or make it available in the form that is of use to a small business down the street that's trying to get started. Um, we can talk about, particularly in a region like the Highlands and Islands, of the importance of our education provision having an impact on the economy and the businesses that are in our area and the groups that are in our area. Um, we have to be really careful, I think, and other universities have to be careful that that impact isn't coming towards them as programs of studies, or that impact isn't thought about purely in terms of the skills they're taking into the discipline areas. Um, we can think about how we can use digital spaces and other approaches to learning and teaching so that impact can happen as soon as possible through the course of studies. Um, and the other thing that interested us about this whole notion of a distributed curriculum and learners producing artifacts was around this uh, notion of digital scholarship for students. We've talked quite a lot about digital scholarship um, and then approaches to digital research and sharing good practice for our academics. Um, but if we want to really capitalise on some of the ways in which learners are being engaged in school at the moment, then we need to think about digital scholarship for our students. Um, the, the digital channels will allow them to communicate what they're learning um, and they communicate it before they, they get to the point of going to a job interview. So think about there. So um, we're into the last 10 minutes or so. Um, I want to sort of just consider how do we think about ourselves in this big picture? How do we think about our academics um, in terms of um, developing our own educational practice and scholarship? How do we use digital spaces and digital approaches um, to do some of the things we probably talked about at the start, to bring forward staff and help them engage in their own research and scholarship, to get their learning and teaching work out there, to share the good practice? There's a few things we're doing at UHI at the moment, a few things we can draw upon from elsewhere. The first, I think, is we've absolutely got to remodel model what's possible um, I mentioned the PG Cert and blended online education that um, I was involved in Napier. Um, myself and my colleague Christina Menka and then latterly Julia following, when we worked on this program, we were really, really keen that as a program for educators, it should absolutely role model the range of ways in which they could use technology to engage their own learners um, and then give them an experience that would allow them to make informed choices. We talk about alignment a lot in higher education. Um, and making sure that what we want our learners to learn 
It's a line with how we teach them, how we assess them. Uh, there's lots of really good programs for educators out there. If we're talking about the value of collaboration and, and you know, uh, engaging our, our learners in digital spaces, um, and we ask our academics on education programs to read about collaboration and to write about collaboration and supports, not to do any collaboration. Um, just there's a bit of an issue there. Um, and, okay, we're talking about academics. Um, they can, you know, they can conceptualize, they can think about how knowledge might apply to situations, but how are they going to understand the nuances of these approaches? How are they going to understand the do's and do nots um, if we don't have the experience that allows them to engage the theory? Or if we're leaving the digital side, if we're not providing them with an experience that gets them to engage in the ways that our learners are increasingly being engaged um, and the ways we'd like to engage our learners. So we need to think really carefully about this. And I think it goes to our staff, it goes not just through talk programs with staff, it goes to things like our staff development provision. Um, you know, you can go to different universities and you can see good workshops on using technology, good workshops on how to create um, spaces for collaborative learning. Um, why don't we just do some of these things online and let people experience it? Particularly in, in an institution like this, where we are so distributed. Um, but the, the, the sure shortcut, I think, to help our academics um, to take forward the practice in ways that reflect how the world's changing at the moment, <laughs> the sure shortcut is to let them experience it. Because when you experience something, you have a much more immediate understanding of it than if you read about it, and then read another article about it, and then speak to someone about it. So there's something here we need, you know, for the sector as a challenge. <laughs> how we support our academics in terms of developing their educational practice has to be authentic as to role model what's possible. We can also look at how we use digital spaces to share good practice. Um, and as we come to the conclusion of this, we are progressively moving away from the original idea of a third space, but you know, some of what's in that idea we need to adopt. So we're a distributed university. We've got some really good spaces for sharing good practice. We've got the um, education development toolkit, education development unit toolkit, where resources can be shared. It's something we're thinking about harnessing in relation to the professional framework uh, for recognising the practice that Crichton mentioned. This is our Alpine framework. Um, and this will be a framework that allows us to give our academic and academic related colleagues fellowship at the Higher Education Academy. Now, usually that process involves a, a form, a pro forma, you complete, talk about your practice, it's assessed. We want to do something a little bit different in addition to that. We want to make sure that at least some of the evidence that our academics put forward it's in the form of shareable, reusable digital artifacts. It might be a top tips article that you write for one of our you know, Learning and Teaching Academies website. It might be a podcast or a screencast to do. It might be um, an assignment specification for piece of group work that they found works really effectively. But let's get some of that and let's share it. Sharing good practice across one institution, a single institution, a single site is hard enough. Um, uh, I think we do really well when we try to share a good practice, but I think there's further things we can do and harnessing opportunities for professional recognition has to be brought together with opportunities to share like good practice in an easy, accessible way. We need to create new opportunities to connect. Um, one of the cross-institutional projects that I've been involved in recently um, with my colleagues, uh, Panos Mahopoulos, David Walker, Karen, a few of us here were involved in it, was to create an open online course for educators around the way in which education is changing globally. Um, we're getting near the point of having a ready. We've developed this course through a process of action research and spoken to educators around the world about what educators need to know in today's context. Um, and we'll have this ready um, probably within the next six months. We'll pilot the course as an open online course. And then that course will be, that will be made available as an open educational resource. We'll package it up and anyone who wants to use that in any institution, anywhere in the world, can take it. Use it for staff development, they can use it as part of um, their own teaching qualifications for staff. But we need to think about how we can harness digital spaces to provide new opportunities. So not just talking to each other, but actually providing opportunities for our academics and, and teaching professionals to connect with others around the world to talk about common challenges and to learn from each other. And that's another way we can try and keep at least on a level with what's happening at the moment, I think. We can think about scholarship um, and how we can approach this in more collegiate, friendly, 
open ways, some of those things that characterize the nature of the third space, where your previous experience and your social status doesn't matter so much. There's a lot of status in scholarship, there's a lot of status in academia, and there's a lot of status around um, uh, journals, journals people might publish in. So another initiative that myself, again, working with colleagues elsewhere, Karen Strickland at Robin Gordon, Robert Gordon University, um, David Walker at Sussex, a couple of years ago, we developed the Journal of Perspectives and Applied Academic Practice. This is an open <laughs> online journal, and its main reason for existing is to provide opportunities for academics who have yet to share the learning and teaching practice to do so. Um, we've got rid of some of the traditional conventions of academic publishing. There isn't blind review. When you send your paper into review, you know who's reviewed it, they know you. And that opens up the possibility for a supportive dialogue about the work to make sure that we can help our academics get their teaching work out there. We're looking to build relationships with the journal with the, um, here at UHI. Um, Frank Wynn is joining the editorial steering group. Um, Gary was up discussions about how we can harness it um, in terms of you know, our own kind of scholarship. And at the moment, um, later this month, we have a special issue coming out um, on the theme of learning and teaching in the distributed university. A theme we picked quite deliberately for its relevance to UHI. Um, and we have a number of colleagues who will have papers in that journal um, that will exemplify what they're doing with technology in terms of their own learning and teaching, alongside other papers that will feature from individuals elsewhere. But um, when we think about supportive spaces, when we think about spaces where status doesn't matter, where it's just about getting good work out there, we can harness that in relation to one scholarship as well, which is what this has been about. So the broader implications for UHI, what might they be? Well, um, Crown mentioned the kind of laboratory of UHI, um, uh, or the natural laboratory, um, mm -hmm. as our Dean of Learning and Teaching, Gary Campbell, refers to it. You'll see even credit there, Gary. I take no mm -hmm. credit for this uh, description, although I like it very much. Um, so this, you know, we're a multi-campus institution. We have online delivery. We've got delivery of specialist courses at specialist locations. Um, we deliver courses across multiple, multiple campuses. Um, we've got opportunities where learners are learning in the field. And actually, where our geography means that we can offer subjects that other universities would, would find difficult or impossible to offer. Um, that, that's really important in terms of how we think about where might UHI stand going forward if we want to build upon already excellent practice here in ways that make best use of our digital spaces and the physical spaces where we sit. We've got um, an as yet unbuilt education lab at the Beachwood campus. Um, the lab that Crichton first, which we're putting together at the moment, to provide a space to research and develop our pedagogic practices. Um, to harness, we want to use this lab to harness the natural lab we've got um, and, and learn as best we can about how to do this distributed learning, open learning, community based learning in a really meaningful way. Um, and again, build upon the excellent work that's, that's around the institution. And there's some fantastic work. Um, the Centre for History, our colleagues in literature in Inverness College, and a lot of public engagement work going out there doing talks to the public. Um, there's the work that Lewis Castle College are doing around trying to take the college Wi Fi and expand it, broaden out across the whole town. You know, again, you're opening up those spaces and making, making those spaces third, third digital spaces for those who might want to use them. Um, so there's no shortage of good things happening. Um, but there's lots of potential too, though. Um, we were involved in the Open Education Resources U, Universal Data. We were on the steering group of the Open Educational Practices in Scotland project. And this brings with it a really good opportunity to look at our natural resources, look at our natural lab, look at the technology we've got. And I think it gives us an opportunity to make the Open Education agenda more meaningful. Um, because at the moment, as I mentioned, we're talking about Open Education largely in terms of Open Online. There's a real opportunity for a university like ours to grasp that open access and open education agenda, shape it about a bit, and talk about how it could be more meaningful in terms of not just online, but on campus. Um, I think we need to think about what would open UHI mean. As a multi-campus institution that's across this huge area of the country, I think we need to think about um, what might open UHI mean in terms of the fact we've got campuses all over the place? Uh, you know, we're, we're resource rich. Um, we're, you know, as custodians of technology and learning opportunities, we're richer than many of the universities that are technically richer than us. And we need to think about how we can harness that. 
um, I think we should build upon the good practice we've got and, and quite seriously consider not just strategies around things like public engagement and the research we do, I think we should quite seriously consider our strategy for public pedagogy, where we can build upon the range of things that are happening at the moment and the natural resources we've got to really exemplify to the sector what this could really be about. So back to the People's University of Scotland that, um, that Leslie was a bit more about recently. And back to our natural lab. I really want to go over there and talk to some of this. They told me I've got to stand still this lecture. Um, so, who's best placed to, to realise ideas around the People's University of Scotland within the Scottish HE sector? Could it be Edinburgh? It could be Edinburgh University, very rich, but largely based in Edinburgh, with a few other posts elsewhere. There's lots of um, universities that think like us, got a broad light and an access agenda. Um, old University of Naples, certainly one of them, some of the fantastic work happened there. UWS, University of Western Scotland, like us, and that they've got, you know, have distributed to a certain extent, really. If we're going to talk about the idea of the People's University of Scotland, I don't think we need to look much further than what's on that map there. I don't think there's another institution that is naturally as well placed to do this and to really exemplify what open education, public education, and education as a public right would be about. And we could talk about things, you know, to return to the idea of the digital distributed curriculum. Like many universities, we're looking at developing online courses, usually at a master's level, and that makes lots of sense in lots of ways. I think we need to ask ourselves, though, as any university does, what would attract a student to do an online master's programme in subject X at UHI versus doing the same programme, a very similar one, at another institution? I think what's going to attract them is things like this. I think what's going to attract people is the extent to which we use our natural laboratory, um, our engagement and our place within the community. Uh, and the communities across the University of Highlands and Islands provide a meaningful educational experience where we might have our alumni who are now working in any part of the world come in and contribute to master's programmes or online teaching. Where we might look at um, the relationships between curriculum and the local economy, um, where we could offer, offer our online students uh, and our own campus students an opportunity to do coursework and undertake activities that they know, because we told them we guarantee it, will have a relevance to businesses or third sector groups. Um, we are much more connected and have much more opportunity to do this than many universities do. Um, and when we think about the universities that seem to be leading the way around open education practice, they're resource rich, but they're not as naturally rich as we are in terms of opportunity um, to, to really exemplify how this could work. Why is it so important? I must have the point, really. Um, when we think about how to better harness our third spaces for engaging our learners, whether they're digital third spaces or whether they're on campus spaces, um, what we're really doing is increasing our capacity to create pivotal moments for our learners in terms of their own learning and own development, um, and pivotal moments that will enrich and expand the edu education experience for everyone, for them, but also for the organisations they lecture, um, for the jobs they, they want to do, for the communities they sit within. And I really strongly believe, and then this is, this is the part on the, on the lapel moment, that um, while we, we need to teach in higher education, more often than not, our role is supporting role. And I think what we're trying to do is support our learners to have a series of pivotal moments. A pivotal moment might be going to a talk at Rygate University on art and chocolate making and say, I won't do that. Or, as I did recently, a talk at Rygate University about bilingualism and the, the benefits, benefits of uh, learners when they're young learning two languages. And then you think, I should have done a French homework more seriously. Uh, they can be pivotal moments. Um, I'm standing here because of a pivotal moment. Um, Crichton mentioned that I went to, uh, as an undergraduate, really quite a progressive forward looking HE college. Um, I did okay at school, but you know, pretty well, but nothing spectacular. Uh, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I applied for one course. Um, which was a course that I, I went on to at Queen Margaret, the uh, information management course. Um, and back in those days, you did a written exam as well to write an essay question. Um, and I remember talking to the um, admissions tutor who interviewed me. He was a, a colleague that uh, Kathy and Jim will remember fondly. And he said, You've only applied for one course, why is that? 
and explained why I applied for that course and why I was interested in that course in particular. I said, okay, and what will we do from the end? And I said, um, well, I'll probably apply next year. And he said, uh, yeah, I can see that about you. <laughs> so he said, um, I seem to know why you want to do this course. I've looked at your, your kind of written work, you can write a bit, or can we take a point from you? And I think that shows how pivotal, you know, what the importance of pivotal moments. And I think it shows how fragile things are as well. Um, and today I got into that course, um, and then being encouraged to think for a PhD, um, and then to do a PhD. I'd never, I couldn't be standing for that. Um, and I wasn't, I'm not standing here because I went to a particular course at a particular college. I'm standing here because of the nature of the people that were running that course. Um, so we just need to think really carefully about some of this. Another pivotal moment for me was doing my PhD and uh, had that almost inevitable point of crisis that everyone seems to have where it's going to drop out. Um, to the one, if we call field of form, they said, you've not come this far just to finish now. You bloody get it done. <laughs> Listening to you talk about this, I thought you failed the PhD for the next thousand many years. So pivotal moments. And I think our responsibility as lecturers, as academics, yes, teach, but support. And support our learners to have a series of pivotal moments and support them to stitch together a fabric of pivotal moments that will take them where they need to be. <laughs> there is a proviso to all of this. In thinking about the wider implications of um, open and inclusive educational practice and then the community dimension, this talk isn't about suggesting that universities should be all kinds of things to all kinds of learners. That's, that's not practical. And that would be, I think, irresponsible. However, this talk is suggesting that universities can and should be doing much more to contribute to the wider social mission of education and have a much broader, richer impact within our communities. I think UHI does this probably better than any university in Scotland I can think of, and that, that attracted me here. Um, but actually, in terms of um, really pushing boundaries, pushing things forward, we're the university should be doing more of this and being seen to do more of it as well. I did have some conclusions, but the points I've kind of covered, so I don't really feel the need to labour them and keep you from the food and wine. So I'll just leave them up there for a second. And I think I'll conclude with a question that I think anyone in higher education should be asked, whether we're in a lecture role, an academic support role. If we have a role in higher education to support learning and teaching, um, there's a question that we should all be asked and we should all ask ourselves. Where is your third space and what do you do now? Thank you very much indeed, Keith, um, for an excellent presentation. Um, and I'm conscious of time, but, and we've got a couple of other small bits of proceedings to, to go through, but I think we could take maybe two or three questions, uh, if you're happy to do Absolutely. that, yeah. from the floor. Um, any questions? <coughs> Roddy. Keith, thanks for that talk. Just one question, maybe a bit too but I'd like your thoughts on it. Do you think education is supposed to be the tyranny of qualifications? Yeah, that's right. Um, I do, but you mean, who's education though? Oh, education. Schools, colleges, universities. Yeah. I think um, there are ways to think more smartly about the journeys that learners might take, providing a more joint experience from school through college through university industry. Um, actually, my sister in law is here, and who works at Pre Market University. Runs one of their academies, which is doing just that. Um, it's you know, a partnership between industry um, and university. It's about providing kind of uh, linear pathways from school through college through a degree into employment um, for those learners that know what they want to do. Um, and I think we I think we need to think very carefully about the boundaries that we put between school, FE, HE, professional qualifications. I think we also need to think quite carefully about the nature of the qualifications with respect to the broader development of our learners as well. Uh, and also to probably take a strong look at the repetition, even within a single degree programme, 
um, some of the work that Peter has been involved in our programme focused uh, assessment approaches. Where you look at the, the spread of assessment that learners are undertaking and what they've been assessed on, and more often than not, in any particular academic year, um, they've been assessed on you know, pretty much 80% of the same types of assessment. Um, they've often been assessed at exactly the same time on exactly the same or very similar learning outcomes. Um, I think there are some of the issues we need to tackle. I think it's about coherent curriculum design. I think it's about people talking to one another. I mentioned the modular system earlier. Um, I think there's benefits to the modular system, but one of the big drawbacks is that it locks individual lecturers into thinking about what they're teaching and how they're going to assess. And unless we counter it, there isn't often much discussion around how does this module relate to this other module or class in the same program. And I think there's, there's lots to do around the coherence even within our programs before we start looking at students' qualifications. But yeah, I broadly agree with that assertion. Thank you. Any other questions? Frank? Um, as you know, I'm a great advocate of, of openness in education. Um, but when I was putting together the first degree program in UCHI, um, I got into a bit of hot water because I, I said that um, the entry qualification should be that you're 16 year old and alive. Um, <laughs> what do you think the barriers in education should be? What should the barriers be? Well, I think our main concern, I don't think I can name the barriers, but um, I think it's there we should think about it. Um, and I think we should think about allowing people educational opportunities where they can evidence that they're interested and that they have the raw skills, and I think raw skills is like be able to deal with the work that's going to do. Um, and where we can make um, judgments about the types of support we can provide to learners that may be coming in with non-conventional qualifications. Um, we might have other types of life experience that are important. Um, I like the idea of them um, need to be 16 in life. Um, I think to be 16 alive, curious and keen. But I think, but I think we need to to think carefully about. Be inclusive without disadvantaging people that might be taking the wrong road um, in terms of their qualifications. Um, so that's not, not really the answer to the question, and I think I need to think about it. But um, it's going to be a good insight into some of the things I think we should think about to try and answer that question. Okay. Could I ask one, Keith? You, you mentioned the massive broken online curriculum and the way they became skewed really towards master's level activity you may be a bit cynical to say but towards really marketing tools mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot of expectation even within that space coming from the UK government um, do you think that the drivers for this sort of shift in coming back to open education and the purpose of open education. Do you think the drivers at a political government funding council level are there in the right way at the moment? Or are the universities like UHI and Queen Margaret and Napier having to pioneer in still quite a difficult space politically and reputationally? I think they are having to pioneer in a difficult space. Um, and I think universities like, like Napier or like ourselves um, uh, pioneering a, a space made all the more challenging because we don't have the resources that some institutions have in terms of finance and um, you know the, the kind of groups that the university come together to do some of these things. Um, however, at the same time, I think institutions that are rooted in the communities like ours, I think institutions that have got a strong wide and access agenda and ethos um, are going to be the institutions that, that take this forward in a meaningful way. Um, there's a challenge at the moment, which I think is still early days. I, I think there are an awful lot of initiatives that are about massive, massive open online courses, other big open education initiatives that are really, um, at this stage, whether we admit it or not, just about the set trying to figure out what the potential of these things might be. Mm -hmm. So, Edinburgh University, for example, um, have done some really fantastic work. Some of the work has been about marketing the, co the paid courses once students come on to it. But they're also quite, um, Open, I think, in saying that um, we've invested so many millions of pounds in this because we want to research the phenomena. 
of large scale open education. Um, they're in a position where they can do that. Um, I think universities like ours, like Napier, institutions like UWS, Classical Caledonia, um, I think we're in a much better position to show how it should be done um, and how it can be done in a way that is about opening up access to education to those that are aspiring to get there but maybe don't have the conventional qualifications and experiences. Um, and at the moment, for me, um, I'm, I, you know, I'm cynical about this, um, or certainly about some aspects of it. I think there is a lot of academic showboating going on around open education problems at the moment. Um, I think a lot of institutions that are trying to show that they're the biggest, they're the best, they're the most popular, <coughs> are all doing the same thing. Mm. Um, I think there's a real opportunity and there's a space to be occupied by institutions like ours. And I think there's a real opportunity for an institution like ours to reclaim the open education agenda because it's being skewed. We're talking about open education and uh, we're almost exclusively, without even acknowledging it, uh, we're, you know, implicitly we're talking about open online education. Um, I think where it's really going to be one and where progressive practice is going to happen is when we think about the open online alongside the open on campus, the open in the community. And it's still, it's still a big challenge. You know, I mean, um, Frank and I were talking about this and about um, how changes in the government and funding meant that uh, we kind of lost the community high school and the colleges that did night classes. Um, but there's, there's a really there's a fundamental problem here if we want to treat education as a public good and if we want to take it forward. When the rest of the world becomes free, when they've got time, we close. Um, you, you, not we, as, as individually, but institutions close. Come five o'clock, six o'clock, Monday, to Friday, and weekends, corridors through the dead space, rooms full of computers that aren't turned on, um, you know, libraries that are open, which is great. Um, but um, you know, we talk about open, and, and, and you know, universities talk about we want to be um, you know, an international known university, we want to be a global university. Be a community university first. Mm. You serve the people on your doorstep. And, and I, think, I think these big institutions investing in large scale open education initiatives are missing that or choosing not to attend to it. Um, but I think we are the best place of all the universities I can think of in Scotland to actually show how that should be done. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to call on another round of applause for Keith because <laughs> I'm going to ask Gary Campbell, first of all, to. Uh, Give a word of thanks. Could I just say that obviously there is a networking event after this, the reception, so if any of you have questions for Keith, I'm sure you will Absolutely. welcome a queue for okay. it. Can I just say something very briefly? Um, when things finish later on at 8 o'clock, I know a lot of people have travelled to this, so we really appreciate it. Just a quick, a quick mention. Oh, the slides are up. Um, uh, the Glenmore Hotel across the bridge and along to the left. Um, 8 o'clock onwards, if you'd like to come along for a uh, first drink on me and then um, some additional food and a bit more of a chat then please feel free to do so. Sorry. Thanks very much. So I'd like to uh, take this opportunity on behalf of all the people in the room here and the people at the video conference to offer a sincere thanks to Professor Smiley for what was, I was expecting something good Keith because we've had a lot of chat but that was really inspirational and challenging. Um, I was kind of worried until you did the proviso at the end, he's gone completely over the top, that uh, really brought it back and grounded it. And listening to Keith made me think of two things from his interview. Um, one thing that when we are talking to him in the interview, it came across that he was, uh, he was really new stuff. He was, uh, he was very enthusiastic and he had a really engaging, open personality, all of which made him an ideal candidate. And the other thing I noticed was he wasn't wearing a tie. <laughs> and it's good to see that both, either of those two things have changed. So thanks very much for that, uh, Keith. I'd like to ask um, Professor uh, Frank Rennie now to welcome uh, Professor Smythe into the UHI Professor Uh Professor Mark Yarden, I mean, always could be on the show, go call the room to call with my, my garage, uh, Keith Smythe, the staff of that some team. Um, thank you for coming. In the short time that uh, Keith has been UHI, I'm very pleased to say he's become a friend as well as a colleague. And it gives me great pleasure to, to welcome him into the professoriate. Um, but a few words of, of what that means. <laughs> professoriate, it sounds like the Stasi, <laughs> or something from Kafka perhaps. Um, the media have a, have a an image that they project of the professor that says 
Um, the professor is a bespectacled, well, certainly, um, eccentric um, individual um, who, who is very clever, but who has certain absent-minded tendencies and so on and so forth. I'm here to assure Keith that um, certainly the innovation and the intelligence that expected, the eccentricity is not mandatory, um, although it may be handy when you're coming back home and you forget the messages that Mickey's actually picked up at the thing. That's a, it's always a good excuse to, to bring it in. So what is, what is a professor? Um, the professor, quite simply, is the highest rank in education, in higher education um, in the Western world. And that's not um, an understatement. Um, it's a question that's often put to us. Um, if you've reached the highest rank, Keith, it's not all downhill from here. Um, but the question is, um, what is it? What do you get? Um, you get certainly honours, but there are many other honours that are offered towards a, 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 an academic special awards, visiting awards, guest awards, and so on. And that's really the small beer, because the professorial title itself is, is the coin. And what you get is the respect of your peers, because the, the professorial title, unlike many others in society, is actually only awarded, not only because you're qualified, but because your peers decide that you should actually be honored in this way. So what do professors do? Well, of course, the media say um, quite simply that they're boffins. It's one of my hate, hate words. Um, what does that mean? That often means that they're very clever. Um, they know a lot of things and a lot of depth, but they won't tell you anything unless they come to your seminars. <laughs> You're expected to lead key areas of your own uh, subject matter. You're expected to do advanced research, and particularly, I think, uh, you're expected to coach and bring on junior members of staff and postgraduate students. But above all, I think, you have to be ambassadors. Ambassadors for the institution, for the subject. You're expected to um, be aspirational in your role and to do things that are cutting edge, to think the unthinkable, um, it's one of the great privileges in life to be told you can go away and think the unthinkable. That's always my excuse. You're supposed to have high expectations and you also have the privileges that go with that. And one of the key privileges is being able to put professor instead of doctor on your credit card. And the advantage of doing that is that when you get uh, into a hotel at two o'clock in the morning, you don't get a knock on the door with someone with a bad back <laughs> waiting for the doctor to help you. <laughs> UHI has, has, in its short career, um, produced, you know, we now have about 30 odd professors. 30 odd professors, that's the bad <laughs> 20 minute odd ones are me. Um, those who've been involved in UHI know that it's not just the three-year project since we got a title. It's been a 20-something year struggle to get recognition and to come from our roots to do the things that Keith was talking about tonight. I think it's incredibly important to realise that we now have lead academics in the country in the areas of marine science, of education, of archaeology, of Nordic studies, and a whole variety of other disciplines. I think it's important to realise that the Professor of Pedagogy is now a member of the Professoriate. So, welcome. <laughs>